Hi guys, welcome back. This is Matt Chat episode 282, featuring the uh, second installment of an interview I recorded with David Shelley and uh, Laura Bowen, some of the designers uh, responsible for my one of my favorite computer role-playing game series of all time, namely the Gold Box series from SSI. Now you might remember I talked to them a while back about their uh, Seven Dragons Saga uh, project. Well, in this part we talk about the history of the Gold Box series and you know, how do they get into, into this, and what was it like working at SSI when they were uh, cranking out these amazing games? Anyway, lots of really fun behind-the-scenes stuff here. I think you're really going to enjoy this. So, without further ado, here is Mr. Dave Shelley and Miss Laura Bowen. All right, so we're ready to talk about some of these gold box games. <laughs> you know, I, I thought this would be pretty funny. So I, I was looking through these, these boxes, and I found a, uh, the Game Trivia Contest... Uh, to celebrate Pools of Darkness, the fourth and final volume, uh, we're having a contest. What do you? Let's see what you win here. A trip for two to the Gen Con Game Fair. <laughs> so I, was, I wanted to see if you uh, if you could remember any of these. Because <laughs> I don't think I I know a couple of these. Let's see. So in A D and D's Pool of Radiance, what are the trolls tossing in the slums? Uh, a tossing salad. B tossing sacks of grain. Or C tossing their cookies. <laughs> the sacks of grave, I do believe. Yeah, I think it is. <laughs> yeah, in the beginning of the game, who meets you at the dock? Oh, what was his name? Uh, he introduces you, and then he takes yeah. you on to the. Uh, well, it's definitely not Flipper or William Shakespeare. <laughs> no, it's not. So it must be Roth. That's it. Yep. Yeah. Hey, that's fun. So, you, do you remember this trivia contest? Uh, uh just. Just barely. Uh, with uh, during Pools of Darkness, I was initially on the Dark Sun projects, and before I got uh, pulled back in to, to do a bunch of the design work as as it got uh, toward its due date. So, how did you two get hired at, at SSI? What's uh... um, well through uh, from about high school age on? Uh, I was a member of a tabletop role playing group. We did D and D, Champions, Rune Quest, whatever was around. Uh, I went off to college, got my degree, uh, came back without a clue about what I was going to do with my life. Uh, <laughs> uh, he always used to tell me the, the thing that I really enjoy in life is games, gaming, everything about it. And who's going to hire me to do that? Because, of course, there wasn't a games industry at the time. And then, after we graduated, well, what do you know? This games industry comes along. <laughs> and my friend uh, Keith Brewers uh, was already hired at SSI. He gave me a call, said, uh, hey, we have a customer service uh, playtester position here. If you're not doing anything, why don't you come by, see if you can uh, get a job? I said, oh. I suppose it'll keep me until I find something real to do. <laughs> uh, I had about a 30-minute uh, talk with uh, Chuck Krogel, who was the head of R&D at the time. Then he walked me back to the main R&D section, sat me down in front of a phone. It rang. I picked it up. <laughs> yeah, yeah. They're... And uh, the fellow on the other end asked, how do I get through the red bleed door in fantasy? <laughs> <laughs> so this being the early days, I put my hand over the mouthpiece, yelled out to the rest of R D, how do you get through the red bleed door? <laughs> and someone else told me, and I relayed it on. And that's how I started. <laughs> Must have give you pretty good insights into the Oh yeah. What, what works and what doesn't work for the, the puzzle, right? Way to, oh, yeah. to learn all about the uh, the games and you know where the sticking points were and uh, you know what people really enjoyed about them because they keep asking the same questions about them. Uh, this, of course, was entirely pre-internet forum, so the phone line was uh, was your way of uh, finding out anything about uh, about the games. Yeah, I mean, eventually we had a little folder that we could refer to each of the games but initially I was there were only seven people in R&D at the time so and it was all in one room so all the phone calling was uh, pretty much 
pestering everybody until I memorized the, you know, the top five, ten questions for each game. Mm-hmm. And you uh, started, I guess your first game that you worked on was Demon's Winter? Um, yep, yeah, I did uh, some playtesting on uh, that one, and uh, was, I think, beginning to do my uh, associate producer role stuff with, with Demon's Winter. So about you, Laura? Well, uh, Dave had been working at SSI for, I think, a couple of years before I applied. I was, I was working elsewhere. Um, so say I, I had an art degree, and at the time, you know, everybody thought I was either going to be a teacher or going to advertising, and I didn't want to do either of things. So I was a little at loose ends, and then Dave said, oh, they've got a position in the art department. And, you know, I knew a little bit about uh, computer art. I had taken a a course at uh, Foothill College, as I recall, just to learn how to use a mouse, pretty much. Learn how to draw with a mouse. There's a there's a little bit of a learning curve of that. <laughs> and uh, so I, uh, I put together a little bit of a portfolio. We had, um, what was it? Uh, an ST? Yeah, we had an Atari yeah, ST. we had an Atari ST at home. That was it. And I, I learned how to, to do a little pixel art on there. And uh, brought that in. I got hired. I remember the very day because it was the day of the Loma Prieta earthquake. It was the day I was hired at SSI. And uh, apparently the, the, whole, the whole warehouse, the, um, uh, where they had all the boxes stockpiled and the shrink wrap machine and everything was downstairs in that same building. And Dave got home and he said they just, they just all went all over the floor, all over the floor. They could hardly get out of the building because of this. So. And I think I was the second woman in the art department. Yeah. It was a, it was a pretty... It worked with Susan Manley, right? Is that? Yeah, yeah. Susan Manley was there, um, so you know, I felt I felt reasonably confident about about going in there. Um, I I guess I was the first person who had an actual art training in there, uh, but you know, you, of course, as I say, you're drawing with a mouse. It's all pixel art. You're literally clicking down pixel by pixel with a mouse. Um, we were working initially just with. Um, Four color CGA and sixteen color fixed EGA palettes. Um, there was a lot of conversion from one platform to another, and all the art had to work on all these different. And we didn't even. Uh, a lot of this, you simply had to redraw it for each platform. So there was a lot of just really uh, basic work that had nothing much to do with drawing skills. You must have yeah, to know a... those drawings pretty well. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah, you would spend quite a long time with each one. Yeah, it was only with the Gold Box games, really, that we started to have a reason for artists in-house. In I mean, in the earlier days, it was pretty much whoever happened to be available to push pixels around did it. Mm-hmm. Programmer art. Programmer art, yeah, exactly. <laughs> so what would you say is your, your favorite game as far as the art work that you did for did for it? Well, first we got uh, more and more uh, technical capabilities as, as time went on. I remember when VGA came along, uh, you know, 256 colors, variable palette. It was Anna from heaven after that. <laughs> <laughs> oh, especially after, have you ever tried to draw something coherent in four-color fixed CGA? I mean, we're talking literally black, white, cyan, and magenta. Yeah, they weren't uh, even pretty colors. I, uh, <laughs> <laughs> yeah, great. <laughs> Why are those colors? Eh? Yeah, and everything had to automatically convert from, you know, with the same bitmap uh, from CGA to EGA. And then when we got VGA, all that went out the window, and you could actually pick your colors it was wonderful. Um, the uh, the Dark Sun project, which was the last one that I worked on at SSI, we were um, you know, expanding uh, the, the capabilities quite a lot. Um, we had we had a lot of good source material uh, to work from uh, you know, from from TSR. Uh, we we were having to follow the style of. The, uh, the TSR in-house artwork 
to a great extent. Which, you know, it didn't bother us. They had some really good artists, uh, painters uh, in house. Uh, but yeah, you know, we didn't even have scanners. You know, we couldn't just scan it and put it in. Uh, the only the only scanner that the art department had actually was one of those handheld ones with a very narrow field of view and you could roll it physically over whatever you were scanning and you had to be very careful to keep it at a uniform speed, not too fast, not too slow. It would, it would blur or it would get distorted. It was uh, not real satisfactory, so you would end up just redrawing the whole thing from scratch. It worked a lot better. Um, but we were we were doing some uh, some very nice uh, stuff with the uh, the portraits, the animations, uh, the backgrounds. I did a lot of the background work. I remember in, in Dark Sun um, tiles. Yeah, yeah, it was all in tiles. It was all in tiles. It had to it had a lot of technical restrictions. Which, in a way, was almost inspiring. It's like, well, here, you know, you have this box of, of Legos, almost literally, because, you know, it was like building a picture from Legos. And, uh, you know, how creative can you get within these, these very small parameters? And uh, it, was, it, was a good, it was a good art department. We had some great people there. And, you know, people had their specialties, and some people were more jacks of all trades, but uh, it uh, was a, a very good atmosphere. I think I enjoyed that most of all the places that I worked in. Mm -hmm. it sounded like you uh, you two knew each other before you started working there. Is that yeah, we got together in college. Yeah, uh, over at UC Santa Cruz. Mm -hmm. So uh, then uh, we lived together after we graduated. We got married while we were at SSI. Uh, for a little hurricane of uh, I think three or four people got married within the same year. There were a lot there. of couples. Yeah, all of a sudden. A lot of people got married. You yeah, have a themed, a themed wedding? <laughs> <laughs> Not really. No, no, a lot of the uh, people were there, but it was just a conventional wedding in parents' backyard type of thing. <laughs> <laughs> so how did you transition from the, the playtesting into the game design? Um, well, the um, projects were starting to grow bigger as we went along, and... Uh, I mean, as I was initially with customer service and playtest, and then I got the chance to do a little bit of producing uh, third-party products. Um, and then D&D &D came along, and I was a long-time D&Der. <laughs> so the opportunity came to uh, essentially be one of the designers there. And, uh, you know, I was able to master the technical details of our... Uh, Encounter control language, which was a interesting little scripting language that we built ourselves, and then the layout tools for uh, laying out everything. It was all done. All the development was all done on Commodore sixty four. Which <laughs> yeah, that was what the, that's late eighties when this was going on, right? The, yeah. I was always kind of curious why you chose the the, the uh, Commodore sixty four. Uh, was the uh, biggest system right then. Uh, it was before the PC started taking off as a game machine. Uh, the Atari 400s and 800s were sort of sitting around. The Amigas and STs were sort of too high-end to actually have huge um, numbers of people playing on them. Uh, Apple II, well, I mean, Apple was pretty toxic to, uh, you know. Oh, you want to talk about bad graphics, though. The Apple II was a nightmare. <laughs> I'm I so glad I never had to convert any art for Apple II. That was Mike Provenza's job. Yes. Yeah. But also, Apple was a little s snooty for quite a while about oh, putting yeah. games on their machines. Oh, yeah. That was just not serious enough for them. That was that was trivial. That was time-wasting or something. Later on, they wow. came around and realized just how popular games were. <laughs> <laughs> I had no idea. Macintosh came out. Yeah, once yeah. the Mac came out. Yeah. yeah, we had an Apple evangelist over at SSI. I remember him handing out his cards. It said Apple Evangelist. <laughs> Apple Evangelist? <laughs> that's right. That's right. And I guess I I'm from where we got the early copies of Photoshop, I remember using Photoshop 1.5 on the Mac on my desk. Mm -hmm. There, I had I had three three uh, systems all in my one cube. I had, I had my uh, MS-DOS uh, PC, I had an Atari two, uh, sorry, Mega two thousand, and a, a Mac. I don't remember 
what uh, iteration of the Mac. But I had to I had to move between all of these just to get one. You used Deluxe Paint on the Amiga? Yeah. Oh, yes. Yeah. Uh, yes, we pushed that to its absolute limits. The, the color cycling was pretty cool. It was impressive. That was, yeah. that was very useful because it, it made for very uh, low memory animations. The, uh, the animated pictures were the ones that gave the most trouble. I remember having to do a Hydra, and of course it's got a lot of heads, and you want all these little snaky heads you know, moving around. And originally I did, I think it was an eight frame animation, and it was huge. You know, I would, couldn't possibly fit on the disc. You, know, you had to get everything uh, for particular encounters onto the, the correct uh, disc. And when you're talking five and a quarter, there's not a lot of space there. Or right, they used to ship on, what was the biggest number of five and a quarter discs that the game ever went out on? Maybe a dozen, 14? Well, no, I mean, we compressed them down to lower yeah. than that. And then we made the uh, player um, create actual playable discs from uh, the initial disc, and yeah. so poor people who had one fl one floppy drive. Uh, <laughs> my yeah, heart it bleeds. Just, oh, <laughs> it expanded. Oh uh, yeah, yeah, because everybody's hard drive was tiny back then. Well, didn't have hard drives the first sets of games that's, anyway. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. The Atari ST didn't have a hard drive. No, nope, it just had a mega RAM. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you yeah. tend to forget that th all that disc swapping that would go on when you get yes. back. But, yeah. Flip but it, you, this disc, we were, flip that. <laughs> as we were publishers, we had to uh, concern ourselves with the costs of uh, everything. Mm -hmm. So if we could ship it on five discs instead of nine discs, we were quite a bit better off. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So how many five and a quarter inch discs uh, is Seven Dragon Saga going to ship on? <laughs> <laughs> Oh, yeah, 321K, yeah. <laughs> I probably could be thousands or millions, I don't know. I yeah. a meeting where Joel Billings held up a CD. And this was probably the first CD I'd ever seen. I heard about them. And he said, guys, every game we have ever shipped in the 10-year history of SSI could fit on this one disc. And everybody went, Whoa! <laughs> <laughs> I talked to some developers, and you know, when the CD-ROMs came out, they were actually intimidated by it because, you know, hey, we've got to come up with content that's going to fill up this disc. Yeah, yeah, I mean, yeah, that's right. Why would we use only a quarter of the capacity? We've got to fill it. Well, yeah, I mean, when we first saw, I mean, great, sort of. All right, that's interesting, but it's way more than we're ever going to use. <laughs> so there wasn't any efforts to do full motion video or. Yeah, I, mean, I remember some of those initial Sega games and so on. Yeah, yeah, no more of those two-frame Hydra animations. <laughs> yeah, I had to. Yeah, I had these like six heads moving, and I had to get it down to eventually. Yeah, just two frames, and only two of the heads were moving. So it kind of went. Eh, oh, eh. <laughs> <laughs> that was all you could do. <laughs> and do you still have your archive somewhere with uh, all these animations? Well, I used to, but I don't think we have any machines in the house anymore that'll run uh, floppies. I'm not sure that I copied everything off onto hard drives. Yeah, I think we have a I big have pile of three and a half inch uh, floppy disks around, but no way to play them. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. What was it like uh, working on these this, these uh, gold box games? I mean, I can imagine everybody, everybody must have been really excited when you got the license. Oh, uh, for yeah. Official, you know, AD and D products. Uh, yeah, it was a, a really big deal for us because, you know, it raised the profile of what SSI was doing to stuff that a lot of average people would uh, recognize as opposed to just, uh, you know, a lot of uh, specific strategic game people. So uh, we knew that it was going to give us the opportunity to uh, do something much larger than anything we'd done before. And that scaling was always a bit of a, uh, of a challenge, you know, uh, anytime. A game company tries to move from one level of production to another. There's always a few teething problems, <laughs> and so uh, you know we added people. And we uh, yeah, they grew the team pretty pretty big after that, right? It was yeah. I mean, about how many people were added? Um, let's see. Uh, with uh, the initial game, I think we. Probably at least double R and D size. So I think we were around. I think we probably had at least fifteen or so people just working on Goldbox game, 
And then we had, obviously, still a lot of people that were still uh, doing the third-party games because, I mean, SSI did most of its games through outside developers. And then uh, it was just with the RPGs that we uh, moved to a lot of internal development. Uh, and so we had to, I mean, I remember when Curse of the Azure Bonds, when we were developing that, uh, that particular office had gotten too small. <laughs> and so uh, George McDonald and I, who were the two designers on, on that game, had to go out to the warehouse and we piled the uh, shrink wrap boxes up to make desks and sat there during the winter when it was unheated <laughs> and typed out our, uh, out our game uh, work there. So uh, it wasn't too long after that before we moved to the next office. But <laughs> uh, yeah, I was going to say, that must have been the old building. Okay, yeah, that was yeah. the ring store building. That was the ring store. Yes, talking of, speaking of Curse of the Azure Bonds, it seems like I remember Susan uh, telling me there was a bit of controversy uh, with the cover. <laughs> On this, <laughs> or was there? In terms of uh, the, or just the, the, you know, the, the sort of chain mail bikini uh, or whatever you want. Yeah, it looks so PG now, doesn't it? Compared to what the yeah. standard is these days. But yeah, there was. I oh mean, yeah, it's nothing now. But uh, but yeah, we have a bunch of uh, we had certain people that were more conservative on that, and some people yeah. want to try to push it. So there was always a, a bit of an argument there, and obviously, you know, the art comes in from TSR, so we had. Uh, only a limited number of choices about what we could choose. So, I think probably Victor was would have been concerned. Victor Penman was always yeah. one of the ones on the uh, let's not offend anybody side of yeah. things, which was good. It I mean, is kind of quaint <laughs> to think about ever offending anybody. So, what kind of uh, design questions or you know debates came up during the creation of the Gold Box engine? Um, I mean, we had. A certain framework we obviously had since we had to do AD and D. <laughs> so yeah. did, the T did TSR get involved? Were they? Oh, very much so. Ooh, um, yeah, very handsome. Were they calling the shots, or was it a? Well, I mean, they brought in. This is the world you'll be using. Here's the artwork stuff, like for cover art and so on, that you'll be using. You know, you could choose from, you know, these five type of thing, and um, they had a team of. Um, writers and such working out the, especially with Pool of Radiance, uh, at least the highlights of the uh, storyline. Um, and then Jim Ward who was uh, the guy in charge of uh, the games over at TSR would often come in for a week or two at a time during development. Um, so especially with Pools of, Pool of Radiance, they were very much uh, interested in what we were doing and how we were going to be doing it. Uh, you know, they didn't have any much understanding of exactly the limitations of the systems and so on. So, uh, aside from knowing that we're going to have the, the main Mithrunor and uh, uh, the general wider world uh, and some of the main storyline bits, we got to we got to deal with the details and the, the individual monsters and so on. Uh, they work pretty well. Uh, they were willing to uh, bend on cases where that's not going to fit. <laughs> you know, we're going to blow our budget on that thing. Yeah, I was wondering what and, were some of those things where you, you were thinking, man, uh, if we just had a little bit more room, you know, we, we just <laughs> wanted to do this. Uh, I mean, all of those systems back then were all just tight to try to get anything in. Uh, so that it was a matter of trying to be intelligent about what you had. It, was, it wasn't more of, oh, well, if we had a little more room, we'd do that. It was more of, what are we going to <laughs> shrink down next? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Even even rather modest initial ideas, you'd have to, you'd end up having to cut drastically just to make everything fit. So is that the, the reason that the Adventurer's Journal was yes. with the game, so you could save some, some room in RAM? Exactly. That's uh, the whole reason it was there. We said, you know, we're trying to tell, you know, uh, a fairly detailed story, but if we tried, you know, one thing would, would be just how much it would take up to fit in RAM. The other thing was the screen's only 320 by 200 to run that amount of text <laughs> across the screen. <laughs> yes, you know. chunky, chunky pixel uh, non-alias text. Not that easy. So, I mean, part of it was to save the players who 
didn't care about storyline and just wanted to hit things, uh, <laughs> they would be able to uh, just go on about it within the, in the single line. Uh, and uh, with the since we were developing on the Commodore 64, we had a, a text editor that had a 500 line limit for all of our code for each of the levels. Uh, that's not many lines. <laughs> so putting in any kind of set of text would just get in the way of trying to do, uh, you know, an encounter or um, any way that you could make a slightly more complicated puzzle in a different area. You know, it would take. So we would have we had the programmers rewrite the uh, system so that it would treat a space as um, just like it would treat a new line, so that we could put two and three commands on the same line. And uh, there was no uh, no comments ever. <laughs> yeah. It was, uh, and without you know, we had no hard drives, no way to back anything up. So it was always on a particular floppy disk until you saved it, and then you know, if you thought of it, you could save it to another floppy disk. <laughs> Version control was non-existent, so yeah. we had to be very careful. We had to sneaker at everything around the building. Mm -hmm. you know, we, for, first, we didn't even have, uh, you know, intercompany uh, email. I, if I was going to deliver art, I had to put it on a disc and walk down the hall and get it to a program. Oh, wow. <laughs> yeah, you just, uh, we take a lot of stuff for granted now, I guess. Oh, no, yeah, the tools yeah. are a touch better now. <laughs> <laughs> And that's all for this week's episode. I hope you guys enjoyed that. <laughs> Should be back next week. Got a third part of this in, uh, this interview with uh, uh, Dave and Laura, so uh, stay tuned for that. A lot of great stuff coming up. As always, I want to thank you very, 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 very much if you have supported Matt Chat. Guys, doesn't take a lot of money. A dollar, a couple bucks, five bucks, whatever you think the show is worth. Just uh, please go over to the Patreon site, look for it in the show notes. You can sign up any amount you like, and that will get you access to the Google Air Hangouts. Just did a really awesome Hangout yesterday. A lot of great times, uh, good conversations, a lot of funny stuff goes on in those Hangouts. So uh, I know you would enjoy those, and I'd like to, uh, to meet you too. So uh, please consider that. Uh, let's see, what about the news from the Matt Cave? Well, a couple of big items. Uh, one is... Not so much news, but I just think it's just really, really cool stuff. Uh, yeah, there's, there's, there's a YouTuber by the name of Paf Dingo. Paf Dingo, Paf Dingo, I don't know. I'll put it in the, uh, in the uh, show notes for you. Uh, but this person has put together a compilation of RPG tavern music. You know, all those, uh, a lot of RPGs, Baldur's Gate, uh, World of Warcraft, even uh, Skyrim. You know, they always have these taverns. And when you go in there, you can hear some really, really sweet tunes really just uh, one of my favorite genres of music. I was really excited to find these uh, compilations. I mean, this is probably several hours worth of this stuff. So uh, definitely going to uh, put that in the show notes for you so you can go check that out. I uh, heard from old Jay Barnson, the rampant coyote. He's <laughs> He was really impressed with this too. He says he's going to uh, listen to that as he's coding uh, the new uh, Frayed Knights game. So that's, you know, really exciting stuff. Uh, let's see. Also, of course, you probably heard that the uh, GDC... Uh, there's been all of these uh, uh, engines, I guess, game engines that have been released for free. Uh, and I'm not sure which one did this did it first, but the Unreal Engine, the Unity 5, uh, Source 2 from Valve, uh, all of those are free. Um, so they don't cost you anything to buy. <laughs> I mean, you, you get it for zero cost, right? I was looking, though, it's not, you know, there's certain kinds of stipulations about, you know, how much money you can make before you start having to uh, give a percentage of the royalties or the profits to these guys, but it, I mean, it looks really fair, and it's really got me kind of kind of psyched, actually, because uh, you know you put uh, you know you put powerful tools in the hands of enough people, and sooner or later you're going to hit uh, you know a real genius, somebody with some real passion is going to end up you know with one of these engines and make the next you know the the, uh, the next pool of radiance or the next uh, doom or whatever. So, always like to uh, think about that. It's fun to think about the possibilities. All right, uh, what about that ale of the week? Oh, yes. Uh, this week I've got a, another one from this uh, MKE Brewing Company. That's the, uh, uh, what is it, the, what does that stand for? Milwaukee Brewing Company. 
this is the, remember last time I had one from them, it was a tea-infused uh, ale. This is the double IPA. Let's see what it says about it. Urban legend is our series of adventure brews. Uh, let's see. This IPA is infused with organic jasmine tea. Oh, so I guess they put the tea in all their all their brews. Uh, let me get a sweet floral aroma. You know, I'm not really sure if I've ever had jasmine tea. It sounds sounds nice though. Looking forward to trying that. Uh, strong citrus notes come from a generous amount of American hops. Hop Freak was born big and bitter, but a sizable malt bill adds balance to this beast. <laughs> Got a really fun character on the can there. You know, I'm always a uh, I love the creativity that you see on these cans. I guess he's sort of a hop, hop monster if you look at him closely. Let's see, anything else here? How to drink craft beer from a can. <laughs> Fine glass, poor beer, cheers. Does it tell me anything? 8.7% uh, alcohol by volume, so, you know, definitely a bit on the stronger side. I'm not crazy, but definitely, uh, definitely up there. Anyway, let's get this open and see what it's all about. All right, so I got some of this hop freak here in the rather excellent drinking horn. <sighs> smells really, really nice. It's got that, uh, I guess that must be the jasmine in there I'm smelling, but it's a very sort of floral scent. Uh, smells great. Kind of a little peppery. You can definitely smell some citrus uh, in there. You know what I gotta say, guys? I, I might get your help with something. You know, I was uh, looking into, uh, you know, there's these kits you can buy. <laughs> there must be some alcohol in the aroma here, too. Uh, there are these kits you can buy. I think they're called something like uh, Essences. And I've heard about it for wine tasting. You know, you can learn all the different kinds of scents. And uh, you can buy these kits, and that'll help you to identify all these different sorts of aromas and essences. So you can use sort of the same lingo, I guess, as the uh, professionals. Uh, but apparently they, they use the same ones for beer, too. So I thought that's kind of interesting. But no, I'd really like to, to buy a set of those. You know, kind of step up my ale reviews, make them a little more professional. But uh, for some reason, all the ones I've been able to find are just crazy expensive. You know, two or three hundred bucks. Some of these things are six hundred dollars. You know, it's really uh, way out of my price range. But I was going to ask you guys if, uh, you know, if you know where I can find something like that for a, <laughs> a reasonable price, I'd uh, like to know so I could order that and, you know, step up my ale tasting game a little bit. So, so let me know if you know of anything. Uh, some of you guys might even have one that you're not using anymore. Uh, if so, uh, you know, let me know and I'll take it off your hands for you. All right, anyway, uh, smells really good. Uh, let's give it a taste. <clears throat> uh, definitely one of the stronger ales. A lot of bitterness, a lot of uh, sort of stuff going on nasally here. Sort of, you know, creeping up my nose. Kind of, kind of a, oh, what is that? sensation. It's kind of strange. Uh, getting all sorts of uh, flavors. It's very complex. Let me try it again. It's a little bit bitter going down, uh, but then you kind of get this sort of sweet citrusy like taste to this. Not really sure what some of these flavors are. Kind of a little bit of a chocolatey. You can definitely taste the hops in this. It's, uh, it's actually quite a quite strong but it's not bad. It's not a overpowering flavor. It's not nasty or anything like that. Let me try it one more time here. Yeah, it's got sort of a sort of chocolatey, roasted sort of uh, malty flavors here. A really good selection. Uh, I'm not going to say it's my favorite, but it's it's really really uh, nice and smooth. You know, even with that uh, high alcohol content, I was really expecting to be. Uh, you know, put off by that much alcohol, <laughs> uh, or at least be able to taste it, but, you know, I really don't, so uh, it was a really good job uh, with this. You know, I like the other one, too. I'm really starting to uh, get excited about this this brewery. I like their, I never thought I would like a tea-infused beer. You know, it's not something I would normally go for, but, uh, you know, I've tried two of them now from this company, and uh, just really, really enjoyed both of these. I'm going to go uh, four out of five drinking horns on this, the Hop Freak. I think I like the other one a little bit better. Uh, but anyway, both are uh, very good beers. Uh, especially if you like sort of uh, something a little bit more on the bitter side and, you know, a strong ale. All right, so let's wrap this up with a uh, quotation. And I was looking for quotations about uh, sort of the future, 
technology, you know, thinking about the, you know, how times have changed since Laura was working on those graphics for <laughs> the Gold Box games. Anyway, I found a really fun quote. Uh, this is from Warren G. Bennis, an American scholar. Apparently, he's a pioneer in something called leader, leadership studies. Anyway, it goes something like this. The factory of the future will have only two employees, a man and a dog. The man will be there to feed the dog. The dog will be there to keep the man from touching the equipment. <laughs> See you guys next week. It's only a waffle thing.